My name is Kyle C. And South Sharaf presents the ninth installment of My Story. My Story is a podcast series that interviews individuals through their paths and journeys and takes us behind the curtain on their way to accomplishing their dreams. So with the ninth installment, we'll have the pleasure of being joined by University of Cal Berkeley guard and senior Jalen Celestine as he updates us on his journey since he was here last. So for those who don't know, uh, he had a major knee surgery after tearing his ACL in May of 2022 at the end of his sophomore season. So he takes us behind the curtain of his road to recovery back to health, both physically and mentally. Takes us through the peaks, the valleys, the trials and tribulations of the last 18 months. His thoughts leading up to graduating from one of the top academic schools in the U.S. His plans for the season with his team and with his new coach, Mark Madsen, and a whole lot more. All right, thank you for tuning in in advance. <laughs> South Sharaf is available wherever you listen to podcasts. If you're tuning in on Apple Podcasts or Spotify, I need you to scroll to the top right below my logo. You see them five stars? Hit all of them like it owes you money. We both deserve it. You heard what I said. We both deserve it. No matter where you're taking this in, hit the like and subscribe button. Feel free to leave a comment or two. And check out my website at SouthSharav.com. Feel free to follow there as well. Once again, that is SouthSharav.com. This is my story on South Sharav Radio. In the pursuit of happiness and reaching the peak of your mountaintop, whatever that journey is, there's always a story to tell within it. And we all got a story to tell. Here's Jalen's. My name is Jalen Celestine, and this is my story. So take us back to after your sophomore season, when it came between the lines, like when did you start feeling differently? Like how did that process happen for you? Um, after my sophomore year, um, I ended my sophomore year out pretty well. Like the last like 12 games I averaged like 10 points in conference. Mm -hmm. So I was excited on that. And then I was just building up my, my strength and agility, my athleticism. So I was feeling really good going into the, into the off season. And then, yeah, I was feeling great. I started feeling like myself, like completely. Um, my shot was feeling amazing. Everything was, was feeling good. And then I, I got hurt on the last day of uh, summer workouts. Now, what, or spring workouts, sorry. And before we get to that, like what, what did you think changed from when the season ended to when you started feeling like 100% like yourself and everything just felt like natural or felt like the game was kind of going in slow motion? Like when do you think that started happening? What, or what do you think changed? Um, honestly, just time, like a lot of like basketball is just like a lot of it's just rhythm and confidence. So the more time I spent like working on it, eventually, like I was going to get more comfortable doing it. So it just happened to be right after the season is when I really like turned that corner. Mm -hmm. So I was expected like I was expecting myself to have a good like a breakout junior year. You know, I hate to do this, but take us through the, the moment, not when you blew your MC, like your, your, your knee, but what was going through your mind at that point? Uh, a lot of frustration because I knew what it was. Like, I've never had, like, a, a serious, like, knee injury like that before. Right. Um, I've hurt my knee before, but nothing like that. So, like, when I when it happened, I knew it was something bad. And then because I, I was coming off the injury the year before, I kind of just, like, felt defeated in the moment, honestly. Like, it hurt, but it hurt, but I was more so frustrated and just, like, defeated and lost more than anything honestly mm -hmm. and i know about a month later you also lost someone dear to you who was also you know one of our own south Sharaf family member uh, by the name of headley now in in terms of this happening right after your surgery like at that point where were you at mentally no nah, it, was, it was rough man uh i remember because every time every time my mom calls me and asks me like have you spoke to your dad and she's like, are you seated? Like, are you sitting right now? Then I know it's something bad. So then, like, I was already, like, post-surgery. Uh, couldn't really move. Like, I was kind of, like, on crutches still, but I was staying in my bed for most of the time. So when she told me, I was just, like, it kind of is, like, like, someone just stuck a knife in an already open wound, if that makes sense. Like, I was already down. Mm -hmm. So that, that really hurt, obviously. And then I wasn't able to co go to the funeral because, like, I physically couldn't get on the airplane because of my knee and everything. So, you know, I was rough. For sure. And in terms of, of his support, 
Uh, what did it do for you? And, and like, what is the thing that you take from that moment and from his loss? Um, what, what, what thing he always did was support me. <laughs> so, like, any time, like, in that moment, especially going through, like, that rough rehab, any time I felt like, like, I kind of wanted to, like, give up in a sense, he would, like, thinking about him and, like, the things that like, he's done and, like, how he encouraged me in my life, like, that kind of helped me get through that moment. And, like, the saying he had, uh, bet not broken, like, that really kind of stuck with me. So I even have it tattooed on my arm. I got it tattooed on my arm later that summer. Right. But like really that 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 real reason, like I didn't want to I didn't want to give up because I knew that if I were able to speak to him again, like he would have told me <laughs> like not to, you know, mm. like he would like he would encourage me to go through it. So that honestly helped me a lot. That helped me a lot, especially especially when I first got out the surgery and everything. Yeah. Now take us through your rehab. What kind of work did you have to do? Like what what's involved in that process? I just want you know just to take us behind the curtain a little bit. Rehab was brutal. I hated. I hated rehab. Every part of it. It was. It was like, every, could we practice? I was able to get treatment and everything while our team was practicing. And like in the summer, we were working out like six a.m., seven a.m., and I had to get there with my trainer because I obviously couldn't walk there. So he'd have to pick me up. But he'd have, he'd have to get there so early to get guys ready for practice. I'd have to be up at like four thirty a.m., five a.m. like every day. And it was just brutal because I wasn't really sleeping properly because, like, the pain I was in at night. Mm -hmm. So I was, like, functioning off zero sleep. Then I, like, fall asleep after practice and just, it was rough. But the exercises, um, just the basic, the normal ACL recovery exercise, I did all of that twice a day. Um, had to go to San Francisco, like, twice a week, once a week to get to see the, the surgeon, to see the specialist. Like, it was, it was a lot for sure. Now, can you explain for those who don't know how hard it is in the mental component of recovery, you know, from such a serious injury? Yeah, um, I feel like for me, I kind of had it worse than than like other people who just tear their knee because I tore my meniscus. I tore both meniscus and part of my MCL, too. So right. my recovery stage, my rehab stage took longer than most. So usually if you get if you tear your ACL you start walking, like you train how to walk again, like right away. But for me, I wasn't able to walk in for like two and a half months afterwards because I didn't want to put any pressure or tension on my ACL, on my meniscus, sorry. Okay. So then like that kind of like delayed my progress and like it delayed like what I was able to do. So that kind of really affected me mentally. And like, I saw other people get hurt and they'd come back before I could even start jogging again. Like stuff like that really like kind of messed me up a little bit. Which I understand, too, because, like, just that aspect of being a competitor and just wanting to, like, get the best out of yourself. Like, I can understand where yeah. you're, you're really antsy and you're, you're like, because that process is slow. Yeah, exactly. Because, you like, like, I got hurt and then, like, obviously, I'm happy my teammates. Oh, it's about to come out crazy. I'm happy my teammates <laughs> didn't go through anything like I did. Mm -hmm. But actually, teammates, like, get hurt. And then, like, they'd be out for, like, a week, and they'd come back, and I'd be like, damn, like, that must be nice, you know? Mm -hmm. Like, I still haven't walked yet. And I've been, I've been on crutches, like, the last, like, month and a half. He missed a couple of days, and he was back on his feet running. So, you know, mm -hmm. it was a lot. But obviously, I had to take other things from the game. I try to, like, advance myself mentally, the mental aspect of it, start meditating and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. And how was it for you not being able to play last season? Like I know you you know the injury is gonna it's gonna have a, that certain timeline where yeah you know you're gonna miss the season, but then when the season actually comes, like how hard was that for you? Sorry to be taking you through this process, bro, but I it just I, 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 I really trying to take 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 people behind the curtain. This is like a, this is like a sage, like a cleansing moment. We're, we're we're burning the ashes in the in the garbage can and letting it and letting it. Release. Yeah, nah, <laughs> nah, I, I, I hear that. Um. It was rough because we went to Europe. So, like, the whole summer was rough that, like, I'm watching my guys play basketball and I wasn't able to play. We went to Europe for uh, for a foreign tour for, like, I don't know how long. It was, like, 12 days or something something like that. Yeah. And that was amazing because we barely played basketball. That was the most fun I had, like, all summer. Not because we were in Europe, but because I was around, like, my friends and, like, like my teammates, my brothers. But we, they weren't playing basketball. So, we only played. We had three games. We didn't practice. Mm -hmm. No nothing. So, if we didn't have the game. The other nine days, we didn't even look at a basketball. So to me, that was like the best time I had for the simple fact that like I felt normal amongst the group because nobody else was able to play basketball either, you know? Right. And then when season time came, 
it was rough because we travel like we they get ready for games and i'm like helping guys rebound or like i'm doing rehab exercises on the sidelines like we're, i'm watching this play games and i know i could help like change the outcomes of certain games and it, it's just rough it was rough honestly but you get to the point where like sad to say you kind of get like used to it and you just got to remember like what you're going through and how, how to get through what you're going through so you just got to put your head down and work and then eventually obviously like came out of that that hole and got cleared to play after the season what helped you turn the corner mentally um like was it time was it being around people was it the process of rehab was it all of it in like uh, combined into a pot yeah you can say it was everything combined like i just kind of realized that like you can't lose sleep over things you can't control like obviously that's not something i'd want to happen to anyone nevertheless me but as i say it got to the point where like all right, i'm six months in i can't be like you know i can't let this kill me six months after the fact you know right so then like you just got to control what you can control control the controllables and then just work from there and as long as you know you're doing what you need to do and what you have to do then I, you could consider that day a win so I started like winning individual days instead of wanting to be on the court. Like the process of basically like stacking successful days on top of each other. Yeah, exactly. Now for you, we, we know Coach Fox was relieved of his duties as as coach. Like this is something else that happened. Mm -hmm. Just the process where, you know, where you were injured for the season. Now you have Coach Madsen coming into to this job this season. In terms of what you've seen so far, what do you expect from your new coach just in terms of style and 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 where you know you're gonna fit in yeah i mean uh we're bringing the nba type offense obviously coach madsen um played in the nba coached in the nba and he obviously has that experience so his play style is very catered to the next level and that's why like our team if you look at our roster like it suits our play style like how everyone could play individually um positionless basketball free-flowing Obviously, there's going to be structure to it, but gives a lot of his guys confidence uh, just to make trust their ability to make the right play and just go from there. So I'm excited for it. Um, I think I could do really well in this offense and playing underneath uh, the coaching staff, offense and defense, playing offense and defense. I think I could do really well. So, yeah, I'm excited. No, which, which is awesome to hear. And, and like I said, judging from how he played in college and in the NBA, like, you know, they call him Mad Dog for a reason. So I, I don't expect that intensity to turn off as a coach. Yeah, I mean, I was expecting him to uh, to curse a lot and, like, cuss us out. But, yeah, he actually isn't like that. He Like, obviously, he gets intense and he, he, he gathers the respect of the room. Like, everyone respects what he says. So mm -hmm. he doesn't even have to, like, get into that position where he's cursing us out right. by any means. But, um, obviously, he's an intense guy. I can see the intensity, but... Yeah, it just it seems like a really genuine dude, um, and he really cares for his players and everything. Like, really looks out for it. So, I'm excited. I'm really excited for the season. Which is good because he, you know, when he when he comes from um, comes from a good family, and it's funny. And I'm only saying this based on evidence. Cause I think I, I told you, I think earlier this summer that um, back in 1998. So God damn, that's 25 years ago. I, he, I, I know. Jeez, gosh, my 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 knee just swelled up a little bit, or just got got a little sore. Just you know, my my back got a little sore just saying that. Um, but no, but um, but I I had a chance to go down to the to March Madness in '98, and I was sitting in um, I, we were in the same um, hotel with Stanford at the time. He was he was still on the team, and yeah. I I got a chance to actually sit with his family, or, or more or less, his family sat with me. And they were so proud, but it was they were so nice, and there were those are two things I remember. They were so nice, and they were so proud. Like they were so unbelievably proud of him. It was yeah. it was almost like wholesome to watch, you know. So I'm like, if that's yeah. any indication that I'm not surprised by what you're saying. Yeah, not nah, like he for sure comes from a great family. Um, he lives in Danville, which is like I want to say 25, like around 25 minutes away from here. So he's obviously a local guy. Yeah. And yeah, he just raised. He seems like he was raised the right way. Um, and yeah, like when you told me that story, I wasn't surprised at all. Yeah, I wasn't surprised at all when you told me that story. Yeah. <laughs> um, now going into your senior season, what like what would your degree from Cal mean to you? Dang, uh, it's just crazy to look back and realize that I I've been in college for four years. Like that's kind of crazy to think about. Um, yeah, dang, that's crazy. 
it would just be like a proud moment in a sense because I'd be lying if I like really looked this far. When I picture myself, I didn't picture this far ahead, you know, at, mm-hmm. at Cal. So it's crazy to see myself here, like getting a degree from the number one public school in the country, getting a legal studies degree. Like, you know, like it is crazy. And I'm proud. I'm proud of that. I'm proud of that for sure. You know, it's funny because when we started this um these episodes these my story episodes and thank you for for being the 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 inaugural guest on that you know to start this off if i haven't thanked you before but when you were starting off like you were still trying to find your way at at long island lutheran trying to obtain a scholarship now you know since then you've you've now become an adult right so you lived in more places than than most people have now what can you say that you've taken from each place that helps you with your day-to-day life now from Toronto to Charlotte to Long Island, you know, to the Bay? Um, I'll say that, like, I'm able to read the room and know how to act according to different people and, like, where other people are from. Being from Toronto, obviously, we know, like, because Toronto's so diverse, we see different cultures, we see different, like, demographics, different, like, everything. So I know how to, like, adapt depending on the room I'm in. But going to North Carolina was a completely different culture shock. It was a complete culture shock for me. So going there, I obviously learned how to adapt in that kind of environment. And then Long Island, being in New York, that was basically like being back home. And then coming out here, it's different, but it's still just like, it's different, but it's still human day and day. So like I, being everywhere I've been, I've just learned how to adapt and be able to hold conversations with everybody and anybody, you know, no matter how rich, how poor, skin color, race, like anything, ethnicity, all that. And, and and going back to, to North Carolina, how was that the culture shock? Like, was it just because the first time you left or just? No, nah, that was a culture shock because, Tor- as you know, Toronto's like diverse. We have, we got Caribbean people, African people, Middle Eastern. We have people from every, every part of the world. North Carolina, where I stayed, it was very, it was predominantly just white. Okay. And like the food was different. The, the, everything was just different. Like, the whole culture environment was just different. So, as a 15, I was only 15 when I left home. Right. Um, yeah, it was, it was a lot for a 15-year-old kid that's used to seeing West Indian stores <laughs> on it, like, every five minutes, you know, to mm. to to not being able to have jerk chicken, like, oxtail, you know? Like, it was crazy. So, and, and it's funny like, how everything those was little, just, like... It's funny how those little things matter, huh? don't I said, it's funny how those little things matter, don't it? Especially... Yeah, you know how I, you know the food I grew up eating. Like it was crazy. Like I went from every day eating like rice and peas, like that type, like Trini food, to eating like, like yeah, it was crazy. Like bojangles, <laughs> and it just like threw me. Like it was just different. Like I like obviously there's like there's good parts of North Carolina too. Obviously, I don't want to like right. I'm bashing it. Right, right, right. But it was a culture shock. It was a culture shock for me. Now, what is the, the biggest culture shock of my life? Yeah, no, I can imagine. Like when we explain it in that way, because it's going from diverse to primarily like it's black and white kind of thing. Yeah, like my like the school I went to, I think I might have been the only black kid in my grade. Oh wow! My, yeah, because a small private school. That's probably like, yeah, I might I may be confusing with someone else, but there might have been like one or two black kids in my grade. Yeah, it was, yeah, it was different. It was different for sure. Mm-hmm. Now, with that said, what is the what is living in the Bay Area meant to you? You know what? And I yeah. ask this because, like, just what you're explaining, like, you've had a different experience. You've seen all those things from each different city. You're bringing it to the Bay. Now you've seen wildfires that made the skies orange. You you went through COVID where no one was on campus. Yeah. And, and, and yeah. now you've seen the things come back, you know, to the mean where it's come back to, to normal. So your, your, your experience or the experience that you've had is unique. So that's why yeah. I, I, I'm kind of asking that because, you know, it's, it's had to have an impact on you differently as a student athlete than, than, than the normal person like, I, or say, than the norm, which would have just been going to school for four years and that it would have been it. But because of all those circumstances that happened, that's why I'm asking what like with that all said now at this stage where you are in your life, what does the Bay Area mean to you at this point? Just living. Yeah, here. I mean, like you said, I see I see the Bay Area in every form. I've seen it when it's been. Lively when the Warriors won, the whole Bay was jumping to mm. it being like a zombie land, like an apocalypse during COVID time. So it's crazy. I've seen I've seen a lot. 
and just like learn how to appreciate it. Like it's different out here. It's slow. It's way slower. It's a different. It's a different vibe to the East Coast for sure. But mm. the weather is obviously amazing. I take the weather for granted. When I come home in March, spring break after the Pac-12 tournament, after the tournament, I always forget how cold it is back home. <laughs> um, and yeah, like I don't know, it's beautiful. The scenery is beautiful. That's one thing I'd say out here. Like the the scenery and this the stuff you can do out here with nature, I feel like it's pretty cool. And that's something I didn't really get when I was in like North Carolina. And I obviously I could get it back home, but like I've never I never have. Like I've never gone on a hike before, right. you know? So stuff like that, stuff I got experienced when I've been in California. And it's interesting because on a basketball perspective, just thinking about it now, you had a chance to be in Toronto when the Raptors won and the Warriors. I didn't even think about that. And the Warriors when they won. Yeah. 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 When, when the Warriors won, I was, I, I think I just had my surgery. Like I came off my surgery. So I was actually on crutches. So I didn't okay. get to go outside and like okay. experience it. I, I think I went to the mall and like some of my boys, they like push around in a wheelchair. Like <laughs> like we took the, the we took the wheelchair the mall gave we were like growing up and down the streets in a wheelchair but like i didn't really get experience it too much yeah. but yeah i was able to see like i was able to see like <laughs> the joy it brought to a city and obviously I, I was there for the raptors parade so you know it's cool it's cool to, to witness for sure i'm gonna put you on the spot which which city was more alive with the championship well i guess it's different for you because you couldn't you couldn't physically be there for the for the warriors one toronto Toronto by far. Mm. Toronto by far. The, and the Warriors also, like, they've won before, like, you know? Right, right. But Toronto, like, they, they never brought home a chip before. I think it's been, like, forever since the city has even won anything, anything for any sport. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah, and I went Toronto one. It was crazy. Yeah, that, that was crazy. I, that really was. Yeah, went Toronto one. It was cra- I know for a fact it wasn't. Cause my, my teammates went. So I saw photos of it and everything, and I know for a fact it wasn't as jumping as as it was back home. Yeah, one point five to two million people that day, back in twenty nineteen. Yeah, it's hard to compete with that. And like I think, we, I'll say, yeah, we didn't have service when we were out there. There were so many people outside. That's right. That's right. That's true. And on top of that, too, what made, what made it crazy is I know a lot of people who, you know, who who weren't there that was maybe watching on TV. I think especially like Americans, they were shocked. You know, to your point about the diverse, diverse culture. When you see it on TV, you're like, "Holy crap!" I didn't know Toronto was like this. Like the diversity yeah. aspect of it was, I think, shocked a lot of people. I don't think people realized how diverse and multicultural Toronto really is. Yeah, not for real. And, I, I I love that home. Yeah, no, for sure. Now, now has living in the Bay Area given you the opportunity to indoctrinate yourself with all things E40? Isn't that the prerequisite? Ha. <laughs> I remember in the weight room meet my old strength coach he used to play like the old strength coach we used to have, he used to play like the Bay Area music every once in a while but now nah, I'm too I'm too <laughs> I'm too young for E40 <laughs> I'm too young I respect I respect the I respect the Bay Area legend for sure but but yeah I'll be lying if I said I'm I'm listening to E40 on the regular mm. all right this is no, no, let's not get in trouble there let's not get in trouble here um, yeah. <laughs> outside of basketball. Um, for you, I want to ask, like, who's had the biggest impact on you outside of basketball? The biggest impact? Oh, there's a couple people. My, my, the coach that recruited me there, um, Andrew Francis, he was, at, he was recruiting me at Iowa beforehand. Yeah. He had a really big impact on me because he was giving me, like, life lessons throughout, like, good or bad games. He hit me about, like, talking and just, like, catching up about, like, life like we wouldn't talk about basketball sometimes even when i was hurt and obviously i couldn't play basketball we'd come over every day bring me food like every single day and we just like chop it up so probably probably coach francis that's the first thing that came to my mind okay for sure okay yeah that's my guy that's and my guy he's in florida golf coach now okay okay well shout out to him congratulations to him I, i'm gonna put you on the spot a little bit who's your all-time favorite mm-hmm. teammate uh at cal since you've been there my all-time favorite teammate at Cal. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm putting you on the spot. spot, but I have to. I have to. There's a, there's a, I got. I got some dogs. Huh? Uh, there's a bunch of people, but the, the my main one though will have to be, um, for sure, 
probably probably my old roommate, uh, Jerry Harder. Okay. We spent like two years. Spent two years living together. So that's for sure the first thing that came to my mind. But with that being said, I for sure have some lifelong friends with, with my with, with my teammates. So yeah, I consider a lot of those guys brothers. So yeah, but nah, Jared Harder for sure. That was my dog. That is my dog. That's for sure. He's not on the team now, though. Where is he now? No, nah, he transferred to uh to Cal Poly. Okay, but you guys yeah, still keep yeah. in contact. Yeah, for sure, for sure. I keep in contact. I keep in contact with a lot of guys. Okay, but you know, Jared, I keep in contact with him. When I was down in, in SoCal, I had I met up with him twice. So I was there for like five days. Okay, I hung out with him twice. Like, yeah, that's my guy for sure. Now, what is your goals for yourself within the last remaining year of the Pac-12? <laughs> like, how crazy <laughs> is it? How crazy is it for you to to watch a Power Five conference that's basically imploding in real time? Yeah, I mean, yeah, I don't know. It's crazy. I, I it's wild thinking about it because I remember the Pac-12 when I was a kid was like top of the top, and now it's not even going to be a thing in a year. That's crazy to even I think about. But I don't know. My goals for it, like to begin with, like right now, I'm just trying to get back to 100. percent I've been cleared to play. Okay. But Congrats. I'm still not. I'm still like what? Yeah, I'm still. Thank you. I'm still missing like the rhythm part of it a little bit. Mm -hmm. So trying to get my reps up and everything. Um, practice trying to be like aggressive, but by the time conference place comes, I'm just gonna be, I'm gonna be, I'm gonna be feeling like myself, uh, playing to win, and hopefully just get some wins. I'm trying to have a winning season, go dancing, go to the tournament, mm -hmm. and go far. Cause I think I think we have the team to really do that. Yeah, it's looking like it though. It really is looking like it right now. Yeah. What's the album and movie and or movie that that's uh, kept you in the proper mode? When I put you in that mode I, to like, just to like, you know, give you that extra step. For me, it's probably, uh, it's an it's, it's album for sure. I'm not sure which album, but it, there's a couple. There's a couple albums. Yeah, I don't you, know album you, you names. Don't, I'm you, bad you, with that. You can, name, you, you can name a couple. It doesn't have to be just one. There's a couple. Uh, Meek Mill's album. I can't remember. I think Championships, the green one. Yes. Yeah, yeah. That's a great album. That was a good album. Can go on. Uh, G, G Herbo's album. Herbo's album. I forgot the title. I forgot the name of it, but the one with PTSD on it okay. and like uh, Party in Heaven, that one, great album. Davies, a couple of Davies albums. Uh, Nip, Nip, a lot of Nip albums. I don't know. I'm pretty, those are like those four, what did I just say, four guys? I'm right. trying to think. Nip, Meek, Herbo, Nip, Meek, Herbo, and Davies. Yeah, those four are like my go to guys that like, Help me like lock back in, for sure. Those are my guys I look to before a game. I can't listen to, so even though I like like guys like Lil Baby, I listen to them often. Mm -hmm. I can't listen to them before a game. Like Meek Mill, his music kind of gets me more like locked in and more engaged and like focused for the game. Last question. Um, so what have you learned about yourself through the last year and a half? Um, I'm tougher than I thought I was. Hmm. That's that's about it. I'm tough, and I thought it was going through the injuries and like uh, people passing away, the injuries and this like deceased loved ones like tougher than you think you are. You can handle more things than than you thought you'd be able to handle. Mm. That's Especially being away from like because a lot of the times too, I wasn't with my family going through a lot of this stuff. Like my when I first got hurt, my parents they came to my to my both my surgeries, but like they could only stay for like a week. You know, right? It's like eventually, just like by yourself again. It's like you just kind of learn. Obviously, I had my teammates and everything, but a lot of the time it's spent by yourself. And you just realize like you're stronger than you than I thought I was. Honestly, it's it's overpowering the isolation at, at that at that point. Yeah, yeah, because it could that could for sure make or break you. Mm. Okay, all right, for well, sure make or break you. Okay, well you know we'll we'll leave it there, but. Um, but before we go, um, shout outs. Who would you like to shout out for this uh, for this edition of my story? I just like to shout out Cal Bears. We're about to have a good, a great season this year. I can feel it, and we're going to turn it around. Have one of the biggest turnarounds in NCAA history. So that's the goal, and I think we're good enough and capable enough to to really achieve that. So that's it. That's it, really. That's it. And to make noise in the Pac-12, the last year to make noise in the last year to make history. 
Yeah, to really make noise, leave the Pac-12 out on a bang. It's been rough a couple of, the last couple of years, but yeah, we're gonna go out on a bang with a bang for sure. My name is John Celestine, and I'm checking out. 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 Thank you for listening to the latest installment of my story. And thank you for Jalen for sharing a story with us. You want to continue to follow him in real time? You're going to want to then follow his progress as he attacks his senior season for the California Golden Bears wherever you watch the last season of the Pac-12 Conference. All right, they're going to be much improved, much more entertaining. And most important of all, you'll be able to track his journey from there. So stay tuned with all of it. If you're a lover of the NBA, you're in luck. You're in luck right now because we're going to have a bunch of content with the start of the NBA season approaching in the next few weeks. Uh, we got our annual NBA season previews coming up. Stay tuned for that, please. And thanks. If you missed my latest episode, my emergency episode of the Dame Lillard trade, make sure you play that one as soon as this one is over. And we got a new episode of the Half podcast next week as well. All right. So stay locked in with us. I appreciate the support. And I won't turn it away, so keep it coming. Keep it coming, all right? So, (laughs) but much appreciation and love for you, all right? And with that said, you've just listened to the latest installment of my story right here on South Sharaf Radio. Have a great weekend. Until next time.